Welcome to Frogs Insider. Jamie Plunkett here alongside Melissa Trebwasser. As always, we are the TCU podcast for the Dave Campbell's Texas Football Republic of Football Network. Gotten decent at saying that whole mouthful yeah. of a name. I was going to say, I'm pretty impressed that you decided to take the lead tonight, considering the time that we are recording this podcast on a Monday evening. 10.30 p.m. my time on a Monday. Yeah. I just got home from TCU absolutely shellacking Houston Christian University, formerly known as Houston Baptist. Um, yeah, they scored 100. Um, 101. 101. Thanks. You're right. Thanks, That's Darius Ford. Darius yeah. Ford with that smooth little step back, three yeah. in a guy's face. Yeah. Break the century mark. And yeah. And, and for other cover. important reasons is uh, Brian Estridge uh, brought up on the broadcast, TCU you know, covered because of an, that important, an important basket for some folks that might you be interested love, in such things. Yeah. Love to see it. You really do love to see it. It was important to some people. Yeah. It well, it was. If it's if it's 1030 your time, that means it's 830 my time. And I will say wholeheartedly, this is my bedtime. In fact, my dog just got up and left and went to my room to go to sleep. So <laughs> it's like, oh, screw you, lady. I'm not yeah. waiting for you. Yeah, he was not happy about it. Um, I'm sure he'll be back if he senses anything um, animal like uh, just, you know, he'll come and bark because Bauer always has to make an appearance. Um, but, you know, Jamie, we're, we're recording this on Cyber Monday and I. I, I don't know if you caught the pretty incredible sale that he, our friends at Hell's Half Acre dropped for us over the Thanksgiving holiday. It was incredible. An absolute banger. Um, they have been a great, yeah, you got what? Uh, Speaking of Hell's Half Acre, for look at that. For the viewers on YouTube, we're repping a little H A H A H H A today. You made you made that a little more central than I think it needed to I be. I didn't mean um, to rub my um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. If you, if you if, if, if you were listening in an audio only medium, yeah. um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like and subscribe to our YouTube channel um, for things you can't get in an audio only meeting like that. Uh, uh, medium like maybe that. Maybe we need but, to move this stuff over to to the Patreon site. Yeah, so. yeah, or an OnlyFans. Um, but <laughs> uh, we we do appreciate our friends at Hell's Half Acre mm -hmm. Stadium Goods. Um, awesome polos. They've got the the vintage throwback uh, frog head here that we saw at TC Rock against Baylor. Uh, great stadium goods and wear. The the football polo. They've got some great basketball stuff. They do incredible work. Incredibly high quality work as well. Um, lots of stuff was back in stock for the holiday. They did a thirty percent off over. Um, we think you should support them whether they're running a sale or not because they are great friends of our podcast and great friends of TCU. So they do a lot of good things for TCU athletes, student athletes, um, and the TCU community. So super appreciate their support um, on the Frogs Insider podcast and um, love that we get to be associated with such a great brand. Truly, truly we are. Very, very thankful for, for Hell's Half Acre. Um, also thankful for Home Field Apparel. Super psyched. Did I am just... not going to touch myself. Don't do that. Um, I am wearing a, I... a home field apparel uh, sweatshirt. <laughs> we don't want, we want to, we want to stay like cool by YouTube's like yeah decency standards or whatever mm -hmm. they're called. I will say this. Uh, I got an email. I don't know what this says about me. I got an email from home field today. It says you're a home field blue chip recruit. And it's because of the number of rewards points that yeah. you have. Mm -hmm. And so every hundred points you get a dollar off your next order so you can get points through home field apparel melissa by doing a couple different things you get five points for every dollar that you spend you get 25 points if you follow them on twitter mm -hmm. you get 50 points if you follow them on instagram you get 100 points if you write a review you get 150 points if you upload a review with a photo i have not done anything but those first two which is buy merch and follow them on twitter you want to guess what my rewards points are right now what is it Four thousand five hundred and sixty-six. Yeah. So, needless to say, uh, when I tell you that Home Field Apparel is some of the softest, most comfortable shirts and hoodies that you can possibly own, I'm I've already in the past, past Jamie has put his money where my yeah. current present Jamie's mouth is, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I. I am an all American, uh, which, and I have 3,500 points and that's with having cashed in a significant number of points. Um, so I, I am, I am with you in that we are, we are true supporters of both, uh, Hell's Half Acre and Home Field Apparel. Um, 
I, I've had to uh, reorder some things because I've worn like not because their quality isn't good because there are a couple of t-shirts that I wear so often that mm -hmm. just not quite as bright as I want them to be because I've probably washed them 50 to 60 times already. So um, big, big fan of Home Field Apparel as well. They had a great Black Friday um, sale, a great Cyber Monday sale, um, and they do throw great rewards your way if you are a loyal member, which Jamie and I, both of us, uh, much to our wallet chagrin are as such. Um, you know who has also been giving me some chagrin, Jamie? Who's that? GCU football. Uh, Friday was rough. Friday, Friday, I, I was, you know, it was a day after holiday. I'm sure you dealing with kids at a holiday. I was, I was temporary. I was, I was in-person aunt for the holiday. So I had nice. my two and a half month year old and nine month old mm -hmm. nieces uh, running around. I was exhausted after spending three days with them. Um, so when you have to do that full time with no school, I'm sure that is, uh, that's a lot to ask. Yeah. Adding insult to injury, so to speak, was, was subjecting ourselves to that TCU football game in Norman. Um, Really, the two years in a row now, um, TCU season has ended with a giant embarrassing thud. Um, but there's a big difference between taking that lump in the national championship game and taking it on a Black Friday with bowl eligibility on the line. And that's uh, as bad as I've felt in a while watching TCU football. Which one's worse? Losing 65 to 7 in the natty or losing by you know 69 to... 45 and you miss out on a bowl I, I think I think the latter right like at least you got to like I could easily just like not justify but I can easily forget the score of that national championship game because of what I got to experience at the Fiesta Bowl that's fair this this one just kind of felt like it, it was the, per the the way the season started and the way the season ended was the perfect bookends to one of the more disappointing um, mm -hmm. not the worst season we've experienced as TCU fans but certainly one of the more disappointing when you look at the momentum that TCU had going into this year True. um the way they they had recruited and what we were told throughout the spring and the fall which I think people kind of read into that a little too much and, and act like we were mm -hmm. sold a bill of lies we were sold what every college football program sells you in August right but um but yeah I mean this one to me was was worse now more embarrassing if you're not a tcu fan is probably losing like that national championship because everybody yeah, was fair. watching yeah but but as, a, as someone who's you know connected <clears throat> to the program and invested in the program friday is it's bad as bad as i felt in a while yeah it was tough and you know i i wrote up there with jeremy clark um friday morning i got up at 5 a.m met yeah. jeremy at his house um and uh, basically North Oklahoma. And uh, then we rode up the rest of the way together. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I think that when you lose a game like that to miss bowl eligibility, everything doesn't go your way in the first half, right? Like TCU had a, had an opportunity at one point. They had, they had the ball yeah. down 14 to 13 with a chance to drive and take the lead. They had just scored touchdowns on their previous two drives, you know, taking advantage of an Oklahoma turnover in the red zone. And from there, Oklahoma outscored them the rest of the half. Was it 28 to three? Yeah. To take a lead of 42 to 16 lead into halftime. Uh, and just the, this, the cascade of, you know, bad passes and missed tackles and broken coverages and no pressure and O-line that can't block for the run. And just all of the things that we saw from that point in the first half to halftime was just this like encapsulation of all of the struggles that TCU had had all year, just bearing out one more time in the regular season. And it was interesting sitting there with Jeremy talking about what we were watching play out on the field because, you know, at some point, you know, and this is the conversation that, that uh, he and I were having at some point, you know, you know what your guys are capable of giving you on the field, you know, what you've tried to employ to get them to do things better on the field. And in the final game of the regular season, with an opportunity to to win and get 15 more practices for some of your young guys, have a bowl opportunity. The Independence Bowl was there, hoping that TCU would win. 
um, to see them fall so flat, especially in that second quarter, was really disappointing. You know, because they knew that there was still something at stake to play for. They knew that they were trying to get their seniors another opportunity to play some football. And they knew that there were ways that they could take advantage of some of the things that Oklahoma had really struggled with in the past few weeks, including, you know, BYU running for over 200 yards against them a week ago. And they just didn't do any of that. And they dug themselves into this massive, massive hole by halftime that, to their credit, they came out and and fought really hard in the second half and, and chipped away at that lead, chipped away at that lead. But the takeaway from the game sat on Friday was, you know, we were hearing about the great effort in the second half to, to get back into that game, but Melissa, they never got closer than two touchdowns. Well, you know, my, my assistant coach for my flag football team had a, had a great saying that seems very applicable to, to what we've been watching from TCU football for much of the season. And it's, it's not what you're capable of. It's what you're willing to do. And we know what the talent level on this TCU football team was, but it did seem often that they weren't willing to do the things that make winning football teams when it came, when push came to shove. And, and we can talk about the second half of that game, but it, listen, when you've got a, a 30, almost 30 point lead going into halftime and you're the team that's, you know, the, the better football team on paper, um, TCU, to their credit, put some points on the board and got some stops, but but Oklahoma also was in a pretty dang comfortable position. I don't think they were sweating for one bit, and and you know, like much much like the Texas game, this was not a team that that had its foot on the gas pedal and was really looking to 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 create chaos. And any time that TCU did get within two scores, it, it was easy for Oklahoma to go down and answer. Like there yeah. was there was really no resistance when there needed to be resistance. <laughs> um, it was. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma was playing with their food a little bit um, because they knew they could because they had a 20 something point cushion at the break. Um, And, and I'm sorry too, like, you know, there's a lot of great kids on this team, but when you go into the locker room down, you know, 40, 42 to whatever uh, it's you're done. Like we've seen, we've seen it, I guess once at at TCU. Right. But that was also a very different TCU football team in a, in a very different situation um, in in the the Alamo bowl. And so uh, I think it's just emblematic of, of what this season has been. It's, it's been little streaks of of brightness and hope, but surrounded by storms that just keep pounding when, you know, when, when you have a chance to break through and, and it didn't seem like, there was enough fight when there needed to be fight. There was only fight when the fight got a little bit less difficult or a little bit yeah. less pressure filled. Yeah. And there were some, there were some questionable moments too. You know, I was curious about the incompletion in the first half that mm-hmm. uh, probably should have been reviewed and, and yeah. overturned to be a fumble. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in post game, Sonny was asked about that play and he said he never got a clear answer from the refs, but we saw later in the game Brent Venables call a timeout yeah. when he wanted the officials to review something in the game, and they did, and it ended up working yeah. in Oklahoma's favor. So there were still, there, you know, there were some tactical things in this game that that raised questions for me, um, and there were also some things that went really, really well for TCU. I thought outside of the interception and a couple bad throws in the first half, Josh Hoover had another very good football game. He threw for over 300 yards. He accounted for five total touchdowns. Uh, he has grown, I think a tremendous amount from his first start this season to this, his sixth start this season. And that's really got to give you a lot of hope. I think as a TCU fan, not knowing necessarily exactly what the quarterback room is going to look like in 2024, but you have at least one capable piece that can go out and, 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 you know, produce positive results to an extent that's got to feel good. I mean, I'm not going to say it feels good. I'm going to say that I'm excited about Josh Hoover's ability and his capability, but mm-hmm. much like going into this season when we we felt like the quarterback room was a little bit light, you cannot go into next season, even if Chandler Morris returns, which if you're reading the tea leaves, it, it feels like, like he may not, um, but you cannot go into a situation with Chandler Morris and Josh Hoover as your only mm-hmm. legitimate options to start at quarterback. Um, and, and if you want to do like, and again, I, I think, I like Josh Hoover. I love his leadership. I love his character. He's shown that he can make a lot of the throws. He's shown that he can extend plays with his feet and that he can pick up positive yardage, but TCU committed malpractice by not bringing in a guy that could legitimately compete for a job. Um, Now, depending on who you believe that could come down to, they wanted to make a smart financial decision that could come down to, they, 
you know, they felt like Chandler Morris was going to be the starter that could come down to guys said no, but at the end of the day, you can't go into this off season saying, Hey, Josh Hoover is QB one next year, no matter Mm -hmm. what you have to go find somebody that at the very least is pushing for that starting job. And if Josh Hoover goes and beats him out, great. But if I'm a, if I'm a guy looking to start at a power five school at quarterback, you've seen some things from Josh Hoover that say this kid can absolutely be a power five starter, but you haven't seen enough to say, Oh, I've got no chance of winning this job. And and that's the kind of thing that you want is you want that really good, healthy competition. I'd also like that guy to be six foot four, but mm-hmm. that might be asking for too much. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. There are a lot of good quarterbacks that hit the transfer portal today. Ooh, today a lot today of day was a crazy, was a moving crazy day. day. Yeah. <clears throat> moving yeah, day so. in the transfer portal. So, you know, there's there the coaching staff has already started to turn their attention to closing up the rest of the high school recruiting class because signing day is just a couple weeks away. Uh, and we, we can do another podcast episode to, to drill down into that a little bit more. Um, but they're already hitting the portal hard too, right? Like uh, Eric McAllister is a wide receiver from Boise state who in just nine games this year had close to 50 receptions for over 800 yards and 12 touchdowns. Um, so this is a kid who's, who officially entered the portal on Monday and TCU coaching staff has already uh, reached out and contacted him right and i know that people are going to hear that and think well wide receiver is not the position of need it, it can be to yeah. an extent it's not if you can the, get a guy like that yeah it's not the position of need but if you have an opportunity to go and get a game changer like that mm-hmm. pair him with a savion williams who the tea leaves are saying that he's probably going to come back next year and jp richardson and jojo earl and okay, now you have the weapons necessary for whatever quarterback that wants to come into yeah. the portal, you know, whether that's Hoover winning a battle uh, or a portal quarterback coming in and being QB one, you've got the weapons necessary, not to mention Imani Bailey, who had 178 total yards of offense and, and two touchdowns against Oklahoma, yeah. finished the season with over 1200 rushing yards, led the team with, I believe, nine rushing touchdowns this season, um, a very good year for him he's got another year of eligibility as well so you're talking about an offense that has all of the things now you've got to find an offensive line line. yeah Yeah. well they're they're replacing four guys on the offensive line and and they need to um but one of the things you know we talk so much about the portal about guys leaving and being afraid of who's going to leave the portal also kind of gives you flexibility in a way that was previously a little bit dirtier to do to tell guys to go Mm-hmm. And I, I think that we don't need to worry about TCU overstocking on wide receivers if they've got a chance to get a guy in the in the in the portal because I think that there is going to be some roster turnover not just from guys wanting to leave but from coaches maybe encouraging guys to look for other opportunities um, because it, as we saw like there, there need to be some changes and um, you know you see it argued back and forth on the fan base a lot of you know maybe they were too loyal to some of the other guy older guys maybe they should have gotten some of these younger guys opportunities to play. Um, But I I think that the one thing we know about Jeremiah Donati is he's not going to be content to let Sunny Dykes rush on his laurels. And I don't think Sunny Dykes wants to do that either. And, you know, as we're recording this, there have been no staff changes. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't know if there's going to be staff changes, but every day that we progress this week, the likelihood becomes less and less. We're going to see something significant unless somebody chooses to leave of their own volition. Um, So if you're going to make changes, then the easiest way to do that is to is to make changes in your depth chart. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities to remake this roster on the fly. We've seen programs have success doing that in a year. We've seen programs fail doing that in the year. I mean, we can look at TCU's first opponent of the season Mm -hmm. um, and see how that ended up working out. But um, I, I think that when you look at TCU, there was a lot of talent um, and there was a lot of ability and there were a lot of guys that we had high, high hopes for, but they didn't deliver. Um, and that's coaching, that's program management, that's um, roster construction, that's uh, usage of players, um, and that's leadership of players. And, but whatever the mix was this year, it was not effective. And so you need to make some changes. And if you're not going to make changes on your coaching staff, then you're going to have to make them with the guys out there on the field in order to kind of get that positive momentum and get that leadership right going into 2024, because this cannot happen again. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with you. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting that Sonny said after the Oklahoma loss was that he is, and, and part of it felt a little generic, like coach speak, but part of it I think was sincere when he says that he has to really go back and evaluate everything mm-hmm. this off season. And, and he mentioned some some certain things about that and part of what he said was we have to go reevaluate how we do spring ball we have to go reevaluate how we do fall camp 
um, and change some things because clearly it, it wasn't good enough to get us ready for this season. So that does give me a little bit of hope thinking that, you know, you, you talk about Sonny potentially resting on his laurels or, or whatever. You know, I don't think that any of those coaches in that coach's room are content with the way this season went. And whether or not fans think that some guys on that coaching staff should have another opportunity to coach at TCU in 2024 or not, whatever ends up happening with this coaching staff, I think the biggest change is going to come from Sonny Dykes and trickle down um, because that's how it has to happen in order for any significant change to happen. It doesn't, you know, you can, you can fire all of the, the, all 10 assistants and replace them with new people. But if the, if the attitude or the structure doesn't change at all, from what it was this year to next year, then you're probably not going to see a major improvement on the field from a product standpoint. And another part of what he's going to do, and I think you you mentioned this really well as well, is he's going to evaluate personnel. You know, I, I think I mentioned on the last episode, the deficiencies from the 2020 and 2021 recruiting classes that have really hurt the upperclassmen core of this roster, especially this year. Um, he's going to have to find a way to grow up a lot of these sophomores really quickly. And he's going to have to find a way to address some more of those needs in the transfer portal. So I think that there are still some major, major, major question marks heading into spring ball 2024. But I think there's also an incredible opportunity for Sonny to show that this was really just kind of maybe the beginning of a development cycle for TCU. And now we're going to be able to watch him build a roster the way he knows he needs to build the roster and develop guys that can compete for big 12 championships and and get into this expanded 12 team playoff. You know, it's going to be so fascinating because coming off of, you know, making the national championship, that magical 12 and 0 start winning the Fiesta bowl, Sonny Dykes could have bought himself easily three years Mm -hmm. of mediocrity. Right. And he cashed in a lot of those chips with his offensive coordinator hire. Say what you want about it. But a lot of people at least kind of kind of raised an Mm -hmm. eyebrow at that and thought, Oh, so this is what he's going to do with all this goodwill. Um, And then I think if he beats Colorado and he beats West Virginia and TCU goes seven and five, we're not having any of these conversations. I fully agree with that. I think seven and five and make a mediocre bowl game. And people would have been like, Hey, we lost a ton of talent. We is obvious. We're going to take a step back. You know, we had to break in a new quarterback and that Mm. would have been completely fine. But not just because of the amount of times the TCU lost this way year, but the way that they lost games that were eminently winnable. You can, you can lose to Oklahoma. You can lose to Texas, you know, mm-hmm. like you shouldn't lose to Oklahoma like that, but you, you can lose those games and be fine. Um, but, but there were so many times TCU just did not look interested in playing as hard as they were capable of playing nor prepared to go out and win games that they were very capable of winning. And so I think that now a seat that probably would not have even been warm on a seven and five season. You're, you're just, you're someone's striking a Flint. Mm. Right. And, and if you go five and seven again next year, especially in the new big 12 or six and six, now, now you've got to prove it in 2025. No questions asked. TCU schedule sets up really, really well next year for them to have a, mm-hmm. a two to three game improvement. Um, yeah. I will, I will not be trying to sell anybody. That this is going to be a 10 win team in 2024. I am, I will never, mm-hmm. ever, ever make that promise again. Um, but, but you have to go out and you have to win seven, eight games, make a bowl and show progress and get your young guys on the field and have them performing at a high level. Even if you lose some of those games, you need to look like, you know, what you're doing out there. And I think that against Colorado and the second half of West Virginia, um, you know, in Iowa state, there was, there was a lot of um, looking good in moments and really bad in others. This team did not get better throughout the season. They did not show consistent progression, in my opinion. They showed flashes, and then they took giant steps backwards. Mm-hmm. And so, I think you would—I would have rather have seen progression, even if it was still five and seven. And I think that's where TCU fans are frustrated. So, this is a huge offseason for Sonny, and I completely agree. I don't think he's going to be content to sit back. I think he's got a job that he wants and a job that he'd like to have for a really, really long time. Um, and this season, he'll evaluate how they do things. And if they don't show marked improvement in 2024, he'll start evaluating who's doing things. That would be my, my assumption. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I don't really need to rehash anything you just said. I think you said it really, really well, but I do think that part of the reason 
some TCU fans might be so disgruntled by the lack of coaching changes to this point. And like you said, they may still come. They may, they may not as of Monday night at the time of recording this, I have every rumbling I've heard of a possible change has been squashed by people who know. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't appear at this point, like any significant changes are coming. Um, And meanwhile, you know, uh, take a second to look at two comps to this program right now. Second year head coach Lincoln Riley out at USC knew that he had to make a change at the defensive coordinator spot before this season even ended and, and parted ways with a good friend of his and Alex Grinch, who they went back to Oklahoma together. Um, and, and Grinch was his defensive coordinator for, I think, three seasons at OU before they left for USC together. Um, but he knew that the defense wasn't getting it done and he had to make a hard call, so he did. You look at Florida with Billy Napier in year two, and he's just parted ways with a couple defensive coaches as well. I think their secondary coach and their co-defensive coordinator slash defensive line coach are both looking for work mm-hmm. now as well on Monday afternoon because Florida decided that the results weren't good enough and there had to be some shuffles there. And, and Billy Napier is trying to save his job by right. getting rid of it, that. because it's, Florida it's, is different than TCU. It's, <laughs> and, and yes, context matters. And, and those, those are not perfect comparisons. And then you've also got second year coaches, um, Dan Lanning and Kalen DeBoer, yeah. who are both playing in the Pac-12 championship for the potential of a playoff berth, right? And so there, there are so many different examples of how second-year coaches can be performing right now that I think on the grand scale of things, doing what it seems Sonny Dykes is going to be doing this offseason, which is focusing on personnel versus focusing on coaches, isn't necessarily a bad tactic, Yeah. right? Because I think when you're in a situation like Billy Napier's in in Florida and the, the, the alarms are already starting to sound, then yeah, you've got to make some dramatic changes. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you're Lincoln Riley out at USC and you just went seven and five in year two when you had the Heisman, the, you know, the, the returning Heisman Trophy winner from last year, you know, granted he doesn't play safety. You could yeah. probably play safety better than some of their safeties played this year, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, when you when you've essentially wasted that level of talent on the offensive side of the ball with the defense that just wasn't acceptable, then yeah, I think some alarms should sound. But the reality of TCU situation is a little bit different than either of those because of the personnel that they lost in 2023. And I'm curious to see if this coaching staff, as it currently is constructed, is capable of developing the two recruiting classes that they have brought in in 22 and 23 and making that the foundation of a successful on-field product. I, I think it would be I think it would be a little too early to fully hit the panic button and start firing assistant coaches before they've given you the opportunity to show that they can develop the talent and the system that they're trying to implement. I think that's completely fair. There's two points I want to bring up kind of to go along with what you're saying. Number one is, you look at the guys that TC was signed on the defensive side of the ball. I, I mm-hmm. think, I think, I don't think it's any secret that the, the people everyone's are calling for their head is, is Joe Gillespie, right? Like the defensive yeah. coordinator is the one that's getting all the heat. So when Florida got rid of their CB, their DB coach and their defensive line coach, um, I, I saw an article talking about talking to the recruits and guys that are saying, I might have to rethink some things here. That was the guy that recruited you. You fire a coordinator, you lose some recruits, right? Mm-hmm. The other thing is you fire a defensive coordinator. You're already into just year two of switching from a four, two, five to a three, three, five. Say what you want about the earth. Yeah. Three, three. Yep. Yes. You're right. Um, I was trying to math. It's late. Um, You're you're already in in that, like making that switch, which is not something that you can do overnight, even in a transfer portal era. Um, You got to have somebody to replace him. And whether like, here's the thing we got to remember too. The offensive side of the ball absolutely plays and dictates some of what the defense is capable of doing. It's no excuse for what's happened the last games of each of the last two seasons. But how many of these elite defensive coordinators that TCU fans are dying to bring in want to come and run their system when the offense is going to run 80 plays a game? See mm-hmm. Alex Alex Grinch, right? He stayed loyal to Lincoln Riley because of their friendship and because of their past. But Alex Grinch is going to land somewhere else and probably look like a really good defensive coordinator again because his offense isn't going to be keeping, you know, getting off the field 
at, at warp speed and TCU's mm-hmm. offense ran at, last I heard they were one of the top two or three teams in the nation in plays per game they were running over 80 plays per game um but they weren't just running that many plays they weren't running them effectively all the time either there were a yeah. lot of three and outs there were a lot of four and outs five and outs different things like that they were there were a lot of drives we, we went over this on one of the game that were like sub two minutes and so that is a ton of snaps for a defense to play. I don't care how good your defense is and how good your scheme is. You are going to get exhausted and mm-hmm. you are going to get tired and you are going to look bad. And so give credit to Joe Gillespie, whose defense has played really good in the second half against Texas, really good in the second half against Baylor and better than they did in the first half against Oklahoma. And so there were at least some adjustments made. There was some intensity, even when those, those defenses were playing a ton of snaps in bad situations. So uh, you know, I'd said if 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 Sunny Dykes had said, "Hey, we're going to make a change at defensive coordinator," I probably would have been okay. That makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Sunny Dykes saying, "Hey, we're not going to make a change at defensive coordinator," I can also say, "Hey, that makes sense to me too." Now, I think that's where you need to see a leap in twenty twenty four. I, I don't yeah. expect this team wins to take a leap, but this defense needs to perform at a much higher level because even as good as TC was last year, there were only one or two games that the defense truly won for that, that team. Now there were a lot of huge moments where the defense came up with big interceptions, big stops, forced fumbles, fourth down stops. Um, there were moments in games, but TCU still out, allowed a, a ton of points in, in 2023 or 2022. Um, they just were really, really good at making plays in, in the big moments and when the lights got bright. And, and that's something that this 2023 unit did not do. They were not able of making the big play when they needed it. And that's, that's how things kind of snowballed downhill, much like what we saw mm-hmm. in the first half. Of the Oklahoma game, yeah, and and that's yeah, partially um, a personnel issue when you lose mm-hmm. D winners and and Dylan Horton and Trey Hodges Tomlinson, yeah. right? Like very good players, you know, losing losing some talent there. Um, it's also partially a lack of an adjustment by Joe Gillespie for continuing to rush three, drop eight. You know, it's it's really hard to be a safety when you're trying to cover for seven to eight seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, guys are going to get loose. And so they didn't, they didn't generate enough pressure from the defensive line this year. They didn't, I think, in my opinion, they were not aggressive enough sending four and five guys at times when they knew uh, that the secondary was having trouble keeping track of guys for, for a long amount of time. Um, And so you're right there, there does need to be a a giant step forward this season, uh, this next season for, you know, the staff to stay as it's currently constructed. But, um, you know, I think that, Right now, yeah, it's it's. I think it's it's a little too early to panic. Even though, if you read Horn Frog Blitz lately, <laughs> this is my this is my Melissa. This is my first off off season now officially on HornFrogBlitz.com. Rough. And I had to ask in one of the many threads that were going on today about coaching changes if this is how it always is. <laughs> and then I was reminded that I'm a basketball person and that it's my it's my regular season now. So, hey. We're we're making small we're making small improvements over there at homeforublets Yeah, yeah. But- like there's there's some times where where I go to try to make myself feel better by commiserating, <clears throat> and then there are a lot of times where that's not the feeling I leave with. Um, the the threads <laughs> devolve into very non football things very very quickly, and I have to walk away. Uh, I do. For a while, I, but- I do love. I do love. The good, the good folks over at Horn Frog Blitz, they are they are incredible patrons of of my work I, and Jeremy. I know work, you have to say that because they pay for you to have a job over there. They so pay a good know. amount, and yeah. and I'm very thankful for them. And I am glad that more and more people on the site are taking an interest in men's basketball and baseball. We've got a women's basketball thread yeah. going now on the site. Like we're keeping people updated about women's hoops at TCU, which I think is pretty dope. And uh, yeah, we should, so. while we're talking about women's hoops, we should mention Sedona Prince, Big 12 player of the player week, of the week, which I was shocked to learn was her first ever player of the week honor. And that's mm-hmm. not because of the caliber of player she is. That's because she's played on some stacked teams. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, she's played with some pretty good players. <clears throat> but what, what like I, I was kind of re- like reflecting on that this afternoon. And, and the thing that's I've been so impressed with Mark Campbell is he's not just brought in talented players. He's bought, brought in talented players that fit a very specific role for this team. Yep. And he's letting them shine in that system. Like for Sedona Prince to be as dominant as she's been um, so far for this first six games and and finally earn player of the week honors in a conference, um, you would think, man, this is this is a, a woman that, that should have had many of 
these in her time. No, she's in the right place at the right time with the right team and the right coach. And so she's getting to, I mean, this is, this is why mm-hmm. she withdrew her name from the WNBA draft was to yep. do what she's doing at TCU this year. And, and Mark Campbell gets it and is making sure that she's increasing her stock if she wants to try to go pro next year. And, and it's not just her, it's Madison Connor. It's, um, uh, I, I don't want to butcher Owens. her name. Oh, Jade Nowens from Baylor. I said the Stanford. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Oh, Agnes uh, Emanopu. Yes, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, she's unbelievable. Uh, like yeah. brought in kind of as a defensive stopper, but dropped 20 points in the first half of, of a Lights game. Out a Lights out from three the other day. Lights out from three. So this is a really, like, I've loved, I love the sport of basketball. I've been playing basketball since I was four. I've been coaching since I was 16. Like I love the women's game. Um, and, and this is as much fun as I've had. And and there, I've watched some great teams. Lauren Hurd um, was an amazing player to watch at TCU. There have been some really, really great ones. Um, but this, this team plays at a, a speed and a pace and an excitement level um, that we just haven't seen a lot of at TCU. Mm-hmm. And, and the pieces Campbell's really brought them together and made the puzzle fit so quickly. Um, uh, yeah. I just, I, I said it, I, I wrote it down that this, this, t- both these teams were going to be ranked by Christmas and I'm looking, I'm looking pretty prescient in that, in that moment right now. I think, it, I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Yeah. Both teams are still undefeated after the men's win tonight. I wrote about 1200 words on Mark Campbell and his vision for women's basketball over on horrorfrogblitz.com. You can go read that uh, another time if you're, if you're listening to this. And uh, one of the things that I've really been impressed by with Mark Campbell so far this year is that. You know, I think it would be really easy for a head coach to come into a situation like this where the program has struggled in recent years, not only on the court, but in recruiting and in fan support and in pretty much every aspect that you can can think of. TCU has has struggled uh, since the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, TCU women's basketball has. And he has come in and in the span of 11 months, cast a clear vision implemented that vision from a recruiting and transfer portal standpoint, handed that vision off to his assistant coaches to execute that vision in practice every day, execute that vision on the recruiting trail, not only this past cycle, but already this upcoming cycle, looking at Haley Cavender and and what she's going to bring to this team next year. Um, And he's generated a tremendous amount of media attention and momentum simply by bringing in People like Sedona Prince mm-hmm. and Haley Cavender and Jaden Owens and all of these A-list tier names in, in college women's hoops. Um, and throughout all of that media attention and all of the momentum and the hype, the vision that he cast on day one has stayed the same. Yeah. And the vision that he's trying to execute, the plan that he's trying to execute has not wavered one bit. And just in talking with him a, a few minutes at a time here and there, I'm so wildly impressed by his ability to just stay focused on on yeah. the task at hand and stay focused on the vision. We'll see if that can continue long term, but the early returns that he's provided for this team are incredible and I have no reason to um expect a, a drop off from the way that he is approaching not only the games but every single detail aspect of being the TCU women's basketball head coach. Yeah. And that is a wildly comforting thing to experience, even in a brief conversation, um, just to know like, hey, this guy is legit. He knows what he's doing. He has this gravitas about him. Uh, and it's just really impressive. Yeah, it's, he's been a great fit, a home run hire um, by Jeremiah mm-hmm. Donati. Uh, and I don't want to say it's because he spent a couple of years in Sacramento because that's, but that is obviously what makes people um, focused and determined and successful. So yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 20, 20, everybody's getting 20 win seasons up there at Sac State now. It's true. Because of it's Mark true. Campbell. Yeah. Uh, Melissa, I want to pivot to one thing before we wrap up this episode of the podcast. And it's something that I talked about a little bit during the mailbag episode last week. And there have been some new developments that have come up in the past few days now that certain coaching positions are open again. And that is the the real possibility of Gary Patterson returning to the front mm-hmm. lines of college, the college football world. Last week, um, I had some pretty uh, s- uh, substantial um, information that led me to say on the show that I thought New Mexico was a very good fit for Gary Patterson to re-enter the head coaching world, maybe San Diego state even. 
And I talked about some of the reasons why that was the case, you know, less NIL impact and ability to use the transfer portal like he did in the olden days at TCU um, by bringing in some, some, maybe some, some castaways, some wayward souls and, and uh, grinding them into a fine powder before turning them into excellent football players. But uh, Dana Holgerson is no longer the head coach at the university of Houston. And in very quick time, Gary Patterson appears to have become a front runner for that role uh, for the Cougars, re- potentially re-entering the Big Twelve. Uh, you know, when you start when you started to see these rumors, I kind of want to get your your quick reaction on on what ran through your mind. I mean, I, I think Gary Patterson belongs in college football. Um, I, I can definitely see where <laughs> where I think Houston could be a great fit for him. Um, I, I think that when you the polar opposite of Dana in a lot of ways, right, personality wise. Um, a lot of resources. I think Tillman Fertitta, who's one of the, obviously the, the BMDs down there for the Cougars um, would, would jive with Gary style in a way that he probably doesn't with Dana. Um, and, and that team was lacking discipline um, and execution, things that, that Gary did a really good job um, of instilling at TCU and building that program back up. It's, it's a sleeping giant, but a sleeping giant who, uh, whose resources have, have been tapped in a way they haven't been previously by having, Texas A&M and soon Texas and the SEC by having Baylor, Texas Tech and TCU all be power five schools by having SMU um, lead them, you know, in the in the AAC as well. And so um, it's 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 a program with potential, but but maybe a lower ceiling than, than previously thought because of all the obstacles that are up against it. Gary would be so interesting there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and interesting is the word, right? Because I, I think from a, what he could do, um, in, in building that program and, and doing all of the, the intangible things, um, we've seen him build a program, making the leap to a power five school successfully before. Um, but, but we know his feelings on NIL, we know his feelings on the transfer portal. Um, and, and we know that, that what makes Gary Patterson a successful coach often is his stubbornness and his kind of sticking to his way. And, um, it's going to be an adjustment if he wants to get back into into high level power five coaching to see if he is willing to be a little bit more flexible in his thoughts in the portal and NIL. I would be so fascinated to see the staff that he built around him. I think that to <laughs> me would be. Yeah. I had some I had some thoughts in the group chat um, about <laughs> what that might mean, but um, but but that would be the difference. You know, it, is he going to try to get the gang back together? That's probably not going to be successful. And it was part of his downfall at TCU was his undying loyalty to so many of the guys that had been around him for so long. But if he's willing to go get some of these young, hungry guys that understand the new world of college football as a, as a figurehead and a, a defensive coordinator that was also, you know, running a football program, I think he could be really successful there. Um, but, but it's, it's, it's hard for an old dog to, to learn new tricks, especially an old dog that's been as successful as Gary Patterson has been for so long at another school. Um, I, I want him to be happy and to have success in college football. Again, I'd prefer not to be in the big 12. Obviously I would love to see him go work at New Mexico or something <laughs> across from his buddy, Jerry kill, where he could live a low pressure lifestyle, win a ton of games and do what he did as a member of the Mountain West back in the day and really ruin some people's seasons every once in a while while still living a pretty comfortable existence without a ton of spotlights on him. That's certainly not what would happen at Houston. Yeah, and and this is why I hesitate with all the Houston momentum that he seems to have is I, I think Houston is a unique job, not only because it's a new Power 5 job, but because you're in one of the few cities in the country that has – every professional sports team you can possibly imagine and bless you bless you the listeners aren't going to hear it but the viewers on youtube are going to see that melissa just muted and sneezed like 15 times in a row it's been building like i i don't know if you noticed me mute earlier i thought it was Mm -hmm. coming and and it didn't and there it was and but i think i got the mute button in time you did you nailed it but i called it out anyways just for (laughs) because it's great it's great uh podcast podcasting um but uh you know i think that Houston needs someone and TCU is similar in this way in in a, in a, in a couple ways, but Houston needs someone that is going to go out of their way to run the, make sure that the hype machine is fully fueled up and running at a high level for that program, because you're talking about a, a city that also has the rockets 
the Texans, uh, the Astros, right? And, you know, you, uh, um, uh, the Houston Dynamo, their, their MLS yeah. team is huge down there as well. I think they're in the, they're, they're making a, a deep playoff run right now. And so you've got to have a head coach that is willing to play the media game to an extent. Mm-hmm. And that was never Gary Patterson's forte at TCU. Now, almost to a fault, right? Yeah. We experienced that in real time several times you and I and um so that's where you know you talk about growth with his perspective of NIL and the portal and all of that he also has to he, he would have to show some significant growth in my opinion from that side of things as well yeah um or I think that that would be a real challenge and I don't know that Houston necessarily wants that they do want someone who's organized and uh, can get players to play at a high level and, and get the most out of them. But I don't know that Houston necessarily wants someone who maybe is only going to be there for two or three years, four years, and then retire. Right. I think yeah. they're hopeful that the next person that comes in is not only going to lend them some of that organizational and developmental talent, but is also going to lend them some stability for a long time. You know, and so for me, I think like a Jeff trailer would work out really well mm-hmm. at Houston. I think that'd be I, a home run. And I and I say all of that to say, like, I too really, really, really want to see Gary get back into coaching. I think it's good for the sport when he is out there hitching his pants up and tying his shoes. Mm-hmm. I stand by my opinion that New Mexico is probably the best option for him to not only get back into things, but also to have the most success right away. Yeah. So I, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think we, you know, we both have had, like you said, various experiences, both positive and negative with, with coach P, but, mm-hmm. um, but that, that, I mean, that, that's, this dude was born to coach college football. Yep. He was. And, and, you know, for, for all of his, his, uh, his grumpiness at times, um, I, I don't think there's a TC fan that doesn't want him to be happy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm here for the plot, right. If he goes to Houston, I, I just, I, I, would I'd already said in, in the group chat that I would be on the first plane to Fort Worth for that Houston for uh, TCU game next Heck fall. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I just, I, I, I hope he can go somewhere where he can be successful um, where he doesn't have to deal with, with as much of the, as the, uh, the BS part of coaching college football that exists now. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I don't know, I don't know that Houston is that path, but I also know that, that he's a prideful man and it's an earned pride. And, you know, is he willing to, to take a step back, I'm so sorry. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. We uh, almost made it through. I know. We um, made it through. To 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 take a step back in um, and and coach, you know, at a at a quote unquote lower level program. But I mean, look, Jerry Kill is living his best damn life. Oh my gosh, Jerry Kill is. Might best... you even say killing it? I got one. You got one. That's fine. That's fair. That's the that's what people come here for. <laughs> um, yeah, like I that dude just beat Auburn. So you know, like this is he beat Auburn, and then he followed it up with not a letdown game, but a win over Jacksonville State. Yeah. And I think that's what their tenth win of the year or something. Yeah. Like he's going absolutely crazy out there. Yeah. Gary, Gary, look me in the eyes. I know you're watching this on YouTube right now. Go be the head coach at New Mexico rekindle the new mexico new mexico state rivalry with your oh. best buddy and just dominate the state dominate the amazing. state it'd be, it'd be so much amazing. fun i'd be so happy it would be so much fun we'd, we'd be out there to cover a game for sure oh no I, I would absolutely go watch one of those games yeah and gary come hire me as an offensive analyst i'm i'm i just <laughs> i'm i'm here for it i put my name out there i'm throwing my hat at the ring i don't have to be oc i don't have to call plays listen i i, I can recruit the hell out of high school kids you know it's mm-hmm. we got this we got yep. this, buddy. We, we can make it. it happen. We can make it all happen. But that's going to do it, I think, for this episode of Frogs Insider. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, just a reminder, wherever you get your podcasts, if you could go to that feed, make sure that you're subscribed, make sure that you've left a rating and a review. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, which has a growing audience, we're getting more people every day. Subscribe to the channel. Make sure you are one of them. Subscribe, like this video, and tell us underneath where you think Gary Patterson should be the next head coach, because we'd love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much to our amazing sponsors, mm-hmm. Health, Hell's Half Acre Stadium Goods, Home Field Apparel. We su- super appreciate them helping us do this each and every week. Um, we will have a lot for you guys coming up in the off season because while it may be football off season, 
volleyball is playing at the NCAA tournament. We didn't even get to that tonight because it's late. Uh, mm-hmm. They'll be they'll be face off in Fayetteville and, and a nice little bracket there. We've got lots of great basketball stuff to talk about. Big 12 season will be here before you know it. And then baseball, man, it'll be pitchers and catchers before you yes. can blink twice. So I'm sitting down, I'm sitting down with Kirk, Kirk Sarlos on Thursday for a little one on one time. So we're going to we're going to have a lot more baseball content here. Right. Uh, yeah. Rolling in the, in the near future as well. Awesome. All right. Go Frogs. Go Frogs.